Good evening. It's been a while since we've sung the song, I'll Fly Away. Love that song. We haven't done it in a long time. And always have in my mind, and some of you will remember this would go back to the mid uh, 1990s when uh, we would have the big singings at Morro Bay High School in 1995 and 1996. Um, those two, in fact, actually 97 and 98 is what I'm going back to, the late 90s, when we had the last of the visa singings, the Virginia Estes sing along. And I can just see those last two years in the big gym at Morro Bay, I guess the little gym was the old gym that uh, we had 820 people at those singings, those two years, over 800 people. 820 in the last year, 98, and about 805, I think it was, in 97. And I can hear Brother Joe Thompson leading the song at the very end, I'll Fly Away, with that little Thompson twang they would put at the chorus that I was confident that Clint was, Clint was going to do because he typically does. <laughs> he typically does, but he didn't tonight, but that's all right. Great song, and it brings a lot, back a lot of great memories as well. But a beautiful, beautiful sentiment as well. Um, I would never wish to embarrass anybody, but I'm reminded and so forth that uh, it's Maya's birthday. Anyway, we want to hope that she's had a good day today. And uh, began a series today and dealing with the great I am. Jesus Christ. First of all, I really appreciate the tremendous amount of feedback that I received from brethren concerning the lesson in the whole series. Several people have said that they've look, they're looking forward to the series as I'm looking forward to the series to prepare it. And in the process of doing that, and I think it's very critical information and one of the things that the I am passages that John is very peculiar to record as opposed to the synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is don't forget that John has this task by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but has this task to portray the true identity of Jesus Christ, especially as it would be an answer to a couple of elements that existed at that day who had very misconstrued feelings or ideas, thoughts about Jesus Christ. You had the Judaizers on one hand who did not want to accept Jesus as the true Messiah and the authority and the power that would come with that. And if this is a gospel which we are relatively sure was written very late in the first century, then we also know that there was the Gnostic heresy that was getting worse and worse, and they denied that the Christ could ever be in the flesh, so they denied that Jesus was the Christ. And, of course, that brought about great trouble within the church because of Gnostic heresy and some other things that were associated with Gnosticism as well. And so we're going to see these I am passages, statements of Jesus, because Jesus is making it very clear who he is. John has put this together in the various accounts to the individuals or circumstances by which Jesus makes these declarations. And so while this morning served as the introduction, and again, I'm not sure if this is going to go strictly to an AM uh, series, even though I'm doing the one this evening, I'm not exactly sure about that. But the point is, is that we want to look at the identity of Jesus Christ, and I appreciate the reading we've already had. I want to say by way of introduction for tonight's lesson, that I love bread, I love bread. And you know these diets where they say no carbohydrates and no bread? What a waste. I, I, I just not interested. I'm going to have a physical tomorrow, doctor's point tomorrow morning, very early. I already know the doc's going to be disappointed in a lot of different things. He's going to look at numbers. He's going to look at situations. My wife is absolutely convinced that I'm not going to give to the doctor full disclosure. She's told me that. She threatened it yesterday to go to the doctor's appointment with me. I love bread. And when you think about it, that in Scripture, do we not see time and time again in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that in these cultures that existed, and it's even true today to a certain degree, but you see, bread really represented what? 
the sustenance of life. Every culture has its own kind of bread, I suppose. But when you take some kind of grain, if it's wheat or if it's going to be, you know, corn or, or barley or whatever it might be, and I don't care even if it's from a French bread type of bread, a type to a tortilla type of bread, you take things and mix it together because this becomes basics, the basic sustenance of life, doesn't it? And I love bread. When, of course, I was in Zimbabwe several months ago at this point, when it looks like nearly six months ago that was. It was six months ago. It's hard to believe. And while they used the corn meal to make salsa, which is more like a polenta or grits, one thing that was very much a luxury to them, what a commodity it was, when we could go to these various stores and buy them loaves of bread. That was something so scarce. And it's not the kind of bread that my wife likes because they were so happy to get this white sliced bread. You know, the kind that sticks to the roof of your mouth. If you put peanut butter on, it's even worse. I love that. But what a commodity, what a luxury it was to them. Bread. So we have a situation of which Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And as I introduced this morning, that in this I am phrase, ego me, this ego me, is a very powerful, powerful statement of existence, but now we're going to see that he attaches it with things of which they could understand and relate to that deals with life, their surroundings. A lot of it is going to be very agriculturally based. But there are going to be a series of metaphors, even as this is, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now the question becomes, why? Why would he say this? And I want you to turn back to that text in John chapter 6, if you would, please. But let's back up a little bit. And we know in John chapter 6, and beginning at verse number 1, that Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sit down, about 5,000 in number. We don't know the exact total of everybody. Did you notice that? The men sat down. That also reminds me of Zimbabwe. The men sit down, and the women, they sit down in the chairs or whatever, and the women stand or sit down on the ground. But, and Jesus takes the loaves in verse 11, took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Ask you a question, first of all. Do you believe that that happened? Do you believe that happened just like that? I do. We have thousands of people in a setting. So many of these people have witnessed a miracle of Jesus, even before the bread situation, the feeding. They've witnessed healings that he has done. Concerned disciples bring to his attention 
There's going to be a need, but what are we going to do with such a small amount of money? These disciples, Jesus and the disciples, did not have lots of money. But then Jesus works this miracle. And five loaves of barley bread and two fish, he is able to feed this multitude of people. And when everyone has had their fill, take up 12 baskets of leftover food. And I believe that happened exactly like that. Now, what is the immediate reaction of the people having witnessed this and even being a part of this feast? They're ready to take him and make Jesus what? King. Oh, he's going to be a king, all right. But he withdraws himself because he does not want to be put in that kind of a scenario. He withdraws himself. And then we see that as Jesus is going to be with his disciples, you remain in chapter 6. We have the famous situation where Jesus with the disciples on the sea and the boat and he walks on water. Then after this miracle has taken place, you go drop on down to verse number 22, please. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples uh, had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got in the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. They're looking for him. So in verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For in him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the work of God? The works of God. Jesus said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. When we look at this, and again we ask the question, why did Jesus make this statement that I am the bread of life? And we know that after the feeding of the 5,000 and they are doing everything that they can to follow him, to, to, to find him, but Jesus makes it very, very apparent that so many of these people were there because they wanted to be able to see what else that they could get out of it. He fed them before, he'll feed them again, is their thought. And so we have this request and this response of Jesus. If you continue on in verse 36, he says, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last days. Notice what the Jews then do, very next verse. So the Jews grumbled about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. 
and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He's emphatic. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I said to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will have life, or will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. One thing we know, there's no way that Jesus is endorsing or telling them to be involved either in cannibalism or the consumption of blood. That, in fact, would have been a transgression to the old law, wouldn't it? Cannibalism was wrong. To eat human flesh was wrong, and to drink blood, to eat, consume blood, because the life is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. What is Jesus talking about? And he's talking about a full relationship, a full relationship. With him. It could very well be a possible allusion to the Lord's Supper in time. It could be. I'm not convinced of that necessarily, but it could be. But what he wants them to see is that what he is offering to them is something that nobody else can offer, nothing else can do, that even when God did give their fathers manna in the wilderness, they ate and they lived, but they eventually died, didn't they? That generation died. But here Jesus is offering eternal life. We have to appreciate what bread meant to societies, even as it means to us, but especially these societies and the language that they used and understood. When Jesus says that I am the bread of life, he is making a declaration that our connection, that our sustenance, that everything about life is absolutely connected to who Jesus is. And so here in verse 35, we have Jesus' first I am declaration from the standpoint of associating with something like this, that I am the bread of life. There is the ego me statement right there as you see, I am. Hortas, tesoes. Artas is bread. Zoe is life, zoe in this form. I am the bread of life. What does this statement mean? Why is this such an important statement? How does it apply to us? Because Jesus is still the bread of life. And there are three simple points that I want to share with you. That all have to do with who Jesus is. And the very first thing that we must appreciate is that is not Jesus the source of life anyway? For those that were in Bible class this morning and then in worship this morning or back tonight, you're getting kind of a triple lesson here. I've made these points. It'll be all three times now today that we've met. And that when we talk about Jesus as the source of life, we refer to both in the Bible class and the sermon this morning in John 1, 1 through 4, but verse number 3 in particular, that all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That we looked at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, we know that Jesus is the maker, the creator of the, of the entire universe. We've been studying Hebrews chapter 1 in the Sunday morning uh, adult class, and that we know that while in times past God spoke to the, 
to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now, most of us, we've heard those three passages a handful of times today, haven't we? And I'll tell you what it all is depicting. So I, so I hope that we'll remember this, right? In triple clear, it ought to be good to remember. But I'm hoping what we're, what we're seeing in this is that Jesus, when he says, I am the bread of life, and what bread meant to societies, what it meant to cultures, he is, he is very much saying, and it is true, that Jesus is the source of life. Isn't it true, all physical life and the creation? We can read in the Genesis account in Genesis 1 and days 5 and 6. What does he create? Life, living things, the sea creatures, the things that creep upon the earth, the beast of the field, all these animals, this animate life, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, who is the bread of life, is the source of all life, and spoke this into existence as the maker of all things. Moses tells us in chapter 2 and verse 7, because we know on the sixth day that he made man. And it says, God made man in his own image. And in chapter 2 and verse 7 of Genesis, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We need to appreciate that physical life and everything that has breath, and we know that he made everything, but we've got to appreciate the fact that the only reason that we can have life, that literally we can breathe. I know what the doctor is going to do tomorrow. He's going to take that stethoscope. He's going to put it here. He's going to put it there. And he's going to go, you know, breathe and take these breaths, right? It's what they do. And what's amazing to me is while he may know about anatomy and he may know a whole lot of things about biology and all of those kinds of things, the most amazing thing to me is that we have the ability to do this. You know why? Because Jesus is the source of life. Brethren, the point that I want to make is that God has high regard for life. But today's departure from that position is evident. You see, Jesus is the bread of life. He's making this powerful statement that I am the bread of life. I am the source of life. And God has always had this high estimation of life. But look at our world. It's been this way for a long time. It's so evident the world has made this departure. The world at large does not have the same, same appreciation of life, does it? You know how we know that? Did you see the statistic that came out last week? Because the big issue about abortion and who's going to be on the Supreme Court and Roe v. Wade and all those kinds of things, and since they have been keeping records in the United States, they've been keeping records of how many abortions every year. In these past several years, do you know how many babies have been aborted in this country? 62 million. God appreciates and has high regard for life but so many people do not how many societies seriously look at something that's called euthanasia mercy killing and that because people perhaps are old are no longer really usable or as they think is really the viable type of, of human beings. And so what? So this whole idea, and you remember back many, many years ago, what was it, about 30 years, I guess, the way, good. remember Dr. Kevorkian? Anybody remember that guy? And it's because the idea that the world does not have the same regard for life that God does. Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. Who are we? Who are we to make such an assumption that we can abort a baby or that we can kill an old person and call it mercy? I'm appalled. And then even beyond that, that while he is the source of life, may we always appreciate the fact that Jesus Christ is the source of eternal life. John 1.4 
The Apostle John says in John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life. And I want to tell you, that's not just talking about physical life. That's talking about spiritual life. That's talking about eternal life. Jesus, in talking with Nicodemus, you know the passage well in John 3, 16. In 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, what? Everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Saved. Jesus is the source of life. We know that He's the source of breath and of physical life, but I'm here to tell you, He is the bread of life spiritually. And so when He says that when you eat the bread that I offer, you'll never hunger again. You'll never hunger. You'll have life. You'll live. Back in our text of John 6, 54, that's where Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Remember when some of the disciples turn their back on Jesus after these incredible challenges in chapter 6. In verse 66, it says, from that time, many of the disciples turned away and followed him no more. Jesus in verse 67 says, well, to the, his 11, to the 12, rather, will you leave me at this time? And Peter says in verse 68, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. John 17, verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus is the bread of life because he is the source of life physically and spiritually. Now, then it goes hand in hand, since he's the source of life, I may suggest to you as well that he is therefore the sustainer of life. We live in a world that doesn't appreciate that either. This world has no idea that the, that the people of this world have no idea the reason why we continue to go round and round and round and as we think and the sun comes up and the sun goes down and the seasons come and go, and we live, we breathe, we walk, we talk, we, we have our families, we have our jobs, and we look at this, and people don't understand that all of this is happening because Jesus is the bread of life, is the sustainer of life. He sustains us. Again, food. Bread was food. It's vital to sustain life. In Genesis chapter 3, in verse 19, when God is giving the punishment to, because of sin, he says to the man in Genesis 3, 19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. From dust you are, to dust you shall return. But they even use the idea of bread. You're going to have to work for your bread. And we live in a society that doesn't want to work for the bread either. We live in a society that's become a bunch, bunch of enablers. They are enabled and are enablers. What did Jesus say when he taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, 11? And after he gives that beautiful opening, Our Father who art in heaven, how be your name? Your kingdom come will be done. He says, but give us this day what? Our daily bread. And we depend upon the Lord for sustenance. I've already shared with you in the Greek, artos is the Greek word for bread, the very common word for bread. In the Hebrew, the word is lechem. Lechem. Because I just want you to think about that in just in a moment. You'll find that word, that word, Hebrew word lechem many times, and the manna is referred to actually as lechem because it had become food to them. When lechem is used, sometimes it's very appropriate to translate it as bread because if the context demands that there was actually wheat or something they put together and needed it and baked bread, well, then that would be appropriate. But there are other times it just simply refers to food, that they were given food. And so for this reason, as you would read in Exodus 16, Israel was given, Israel was given manna in the desert and it's referred to as lechem. It's referred to as manna, but it's referred to as lechem. Remember the miracle that took place in the household of the widow, uh, widow uh, Zarephath, with the prophet Elijah? And she had the son that was very ill. 
But there was a situation where he made sure that her, her bin never ran out of what? Flour so that she could make bread and live, as you would read that in 1 Kings 17. That what all these things do is they illustrate the power of God, but they illustrate that God has that ability certainly to sustain people. And we need to learn that lesson. What I want us to see that when Jesus says that I am the bread of life, Jesus is the one that gives life. Yes, and Jesus is the one that sustains life and eternal life. Where was Jesus born? Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where was Jesus born? Who wants to answer that? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Beth house. Lechem. Bread, food. A place of bread. A house of bread. Is that some kind of cosmic coincidence? That it was prophesied in, Ma in, uh, in where is that? Micah 5 and verse 2. I started to say Malachi. I knew that wasn't right. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. That he would be born in Bethlehem. It's identified as a city of David, yes, but it was the house of the place of bread. So no wonder that as Jesus says that I am the bread of life, and we understand that sustenance comes from him. Uh, listen to me. Uh, this is such, oh, this is so important to me it is. Why is it that every Sunday that we come and we partake of the Lord's Supper, because this is our Bethlehem. This is the house of bread. This is where we may come and eat and live. For the life of me, I do not get it. Why there would be certain kinds of churches that say, let's reduce that to once a month. Or once a quarter. Or whatever. I want to tell you that what we see in the New Testament is they did it on the first day of the week. That's why they came on the first day of the week, Acts 20 verse 7. The disciples came to break bread on that first day of the week. But you know what? We need this that we may what? Live. And have fellowship. Does that make sense? Jesus said, I'm the bread the bread of life, because he's the sustainer of life. Not just physically, although that's very true. Through him all things hold together, consist. But the sustainer of eternal life. It's fellowship with him. When we look at the scripture and what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we know that when Paul is quoting Jesus verbatim, and Jesus says, take, eat this bread. He says, take, drink this cup. But do this in remembrance of me. But it's a direct fellowship with Christ. In the preceding chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, Paul says the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread, artos, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though being many, are one bread, and one body, if we all partake, we all partake of that one bread. How important is that to us? And when we miss this on the Lord's day, on the first day of the week, I'm telling you what, we are missing a blessing. We are missing out on our own spiritual Bethlehem. And furthermore, his words are life. You see, he is the sustainer of life because his words are life. And if we abide by his word, in John 6, 63, it is said, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words Jesus said, I speak to you are spirit and they are life. No wonder Jesus said in response to the devil in temptation, he says, in fact, what did the devil, what was the, first, what was the very first temptation? If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become our toss. Let them to the Jew. Bread. But Jesus says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you want to know why? Because God's words are life. My friends, Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the sustainer of life. And I close by saying that Jesus is our satisfaction in life. 
Do we still have that song? I just now thought of it right now, Clint. But we sing the song that's called I'll Be Satisfied. I don't even know if it's in this book anymore, in this particular book, if we ever sing that. I'll be satisfied. It's very interesting when you go back to John chapter 6, and in the, in the statement of verse 35 where he says, I am the bread of life, but I, I just want you to look at that again. And in verse 35 of John chapter 6, and Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life, but here it is, watch this. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That's an amazing offer. To think that we could eat of bread, to think that we could partake even of blood in the way that he uses in this symbol, but never to hunger again, never to thirst again. Maybe we don't think about that physically so much because for most of us, you know what? We like to eat. And not just because we're hungry and our body needs it to survive, but you know, with a lot of us, we like to eat. Why? Because, man, it tastes good. Right? But this is an amazing offer that Jesus is saying, much like he had said to the woman at the well, uh, in, in the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, that if she would drink of the water, the living water that he offers, he's, she said to her, what? You'll never thirst again. And here's what he's saying, that if you'll eat this bread, if you'll do this, you'll never hunger again. Should we not want that? He says, he who comes to me shall never hunger. Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. The psalmist declared in Psalm 107 and verse 9, For he that is speaking of God satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. We get these pictures, these statements in the Bible that what God supplies in food, what God supplies in bread, and especially when it comes to our spiritual needs, that we can be filled, we can be satisfied. You see, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, because listen, I am the kind of bread that I give you, you will be satisfied. We went to our normal place for lunch today, a little Maya Mexican restaurant in North Morro Bay. We do that most Sundays after services. I ordered a nice lunch. It was very good. The two items, you know, with the rice and beans and all that. And it was just, it seemed like there was more on the plate than normal, and I just couldn't begin to eat it all. And finally, because, you know, sometimes we're not smart enough to do this, I finally just pushed the plate away and thought, okay, this is enough. You know, I, was, I grew up in that era when it was, you know, that a clean plate's a happy plate and all those kinds of things. Well, hence, <laughs> well, anyway, I rest my case. But anyway. But the fact was I was satisfied. And Jordan, the waitress, she came by and she says, Brent, are you, you, are you, are you, full? Are you full? In fact, she said, are you full? I said, I am full. And I was satisfied. But here was the crazy thing. About two hours later, I was no longer satisfied. And I was ready to have a piece of pie and a cup of tea. That's just sweeter bread with fruit in it. Jesus said, I will give you something that you're going to be satisfied. Jesus is our satisfaction in life. And that's why in our text of John chapter 6, but back up earlier in verse 27, he says, this is the food that endures to everlasting life. Brethren, all I want to tell you as we close is that all other sources fail to satisfy. And I don't care how much wealth or fame or success, education, I don't care what else we might achieve or have in this life. These things are so temporary and they fail to satisfy. No matter what it is that we crave or desire or we just think that I've got something empty in me that's got to be filled up, that anything that this world and life has to offer here just fails to satisfy. 
No wonder Paul talked about contentment in 1 Timothy 6, 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing to this world and it is certain we carry nothing out. Having food and clothing and these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know why? Because, oh, they may seek it, seek it, but it just never gets satisfied. Why Paul had written to the Philippian brethren in Philippians 4 and verse 11, he says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be what? Content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know why? Because only Christ can satisfy us. Only Christ. In Christ do we find satisfaction. So, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I want to suggest to you there's a lot to that statement. To that declarative. I am. Ego. A me. Who are tas. Tezoes. Come to the bread of life. And partake of what Jesus offers. And if you'll do that. Your needs will be completely met. Are you ready to eat? Are you ready to partake? He invites you to do that. And if we can help you, whatever your spiritual need may be, you can do that now. Won't you come to this time as we stand and sing this song? That has happened.